Good morning and welcome to today's webcast. No panic in a pandemic, credit evaluation during COVID-19. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And with that, I will turn it over to Gabe to get us started. Thank you, Emily. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Gabe Michand. I'm the Financial Institutions National Practice Leader for Moss Adams, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, David Eason. Dave is a Senior Managing Director at Ankura. It's a global consulting firm that specializes in evaluation, risk advisory, litigation support, and workouts. And one thing I'm definitely excited to uh, participate in today and moderate this session is uh, Dave brings a lot of practical experience and a lot of recent experience uh, I will characterize it as uh, performing credit due diligence and valuation work for uh, one of the largest uh, successful mergers this year on the East Coast, one of the largest successful on the West Coast, and a few in between. And so he's got a lot of insight into credit marks and, and in terms of acquisition and due diligence. And I know in looking at the attendees, we've got a substantial number of financial institutions, but we do have some other other uh, uh, companies as well. And so. Uh, we welcome you, and uh, we try to gear the, the polling questions to your company if you can participate, but if you're not able to, then we would ask you to uh, click the alternative answer as well. But uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Dave. Yeah, good good morning, Gabe. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I'm looking forward to talking about a lot of this. It's kind of very timely right now, and we, we've got a quite a bit of experience we can talk about today. All right, and before we get going, we're actually going to start with a polling question for practice for everybody. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily to administer the polling question. All right, thank you. Our first polling question this morning, based on your company's interaction with your borrower's customers, are you A, confident that your company and your region will weather the storm? B, mildly concerned that your delinquencies and perhaps your losses may be headed in the wrong direction. C, very worried about the next 12 months, especially as loans come off deferral and borrowers use up their PPP funds. D, I lose sleep at night over the credit exposure in my company's loan portfolio. Or E, I'm not affiliated with a financial institution or company that lends. 
and I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in our polls today, please <clears throat> click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. We'll give everyone a couple more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. All right, it's uh, good to see that most are confident and not too many people are losing sleep. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Dave, any thoughts and just to get going. Yeah, Gabe, thank you very much. I think that B and C are a lot of what we see with our clients as we talk to them, as, we, as they kind of start to grapple with the whole question of what COVID has done to them. And I think we're still early, but I think it's nonetheless kind of interesting to see that you've still got about almost a quarter of um, quarter of the group that's mildly concerned. Um, we put the D in, um, I lose sleep at night over the credit exposure, only because there are people that have dramatic concerns about it. And candidly, we haven't seen a whole lot of that yet. But I think it's this we'll talk about in a moment. It's a few months away from this happening. So with that, let's talk a little bit about today, about where we're going and so forth. Um, as Gabe mentioned, our firm does a lot of work with both credit evaluation and with, um, with valuation and mergers and acquisitions. We do ongoing credit reviews on a fairly regular basis as well. And we have also been fairly active in working with our clients in developing CECL modeling and validating the CECL testing. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about the actual experiences we've had in the three, that, the three credit evaluations slash valuations that we've done in the past month or so. It's been kind of interesting. It's been kind of an exposure. And from my standpoint, very briefly, while I've been in this business, I love it. This is not a good time. You're seeing a lot as we look through credit analyses, as we try to figure out valuation and so forth. You see a lot of circumstances where people have put a lot of their lives, a lot of their efforts into making something really work. And what's happened, particularly since early March, is nothing that anybody anticipated, nothing any, anybody could expect. And so we're going to walk away, and I think the question today is how well prepared are those of you who are working with credit portfolios to weather the storm, and what techniques can you use now that will help you through the process? So I start by taking, taking a look at this. And I'm kind of an older guy, as some of you who know me know. Um, been around, I lived through the savings and loan crisis, the 2008 crisis, and enough other, um, enough other recessions over the years to write, almost write a couple books about. But this one is one for the, this is one for the road. I mean, good Lord, to see the kind of GDP decrease that we saw in the first quarter this year and the implication that that's had on our clients, on our economy, and everything that we've worked with has just been amazing. It's been equally amazing to look and see that coming into 2020, we're at what economists like to describe as full employment level of unemployment meaning an ambient kind of unemployment level. And we're working on a project right now, for example, where the unemployment in the state is almost 14%. I mean, whoa, that is beyond anything we've really seen, and I haven't seen that since I was, a, since I was really young working in western Illinois, and we saw some agricultural implement manufacturers that were producing unemployment that had shut down and unemployment rates were in the 20s. You just don't see that statewide and nationwide very often. And when you put that together with the fact that it's going to be 2022 before we start to get back to normal GDP levels, we have 14% national unemployment peaks. The whole issue is for many of us who got into the banking because we enjoyed it, because we focused on it, this ain't fun. This just really isn't. And it's creating some real challenges. So when we look and we start to see some of the trends and you start to worry and think, is the worst really yet to come? 
And so we start with deferrals and PPP. And let's deal with it conceptually for a moment. PPP is kind of a tide me over. It was to cover oper certain operating expenses, notably compensation, until things start to get a little bit better. We all have clients, we've all seen loans, we've all seen relationships where we have PPP, okay? It's good, it helped carry people through for a time. Is it good, is it bad? It what depends on the institution and the opportunity. One of the things that I got a kick out of, exactly with PPP as a side note, is there is a Catholic church in Winnetka, Illinois, that got over a half a million dollars of PPP. It's the name of the parish was Faith, Hope, and Charity. And candidly, if any of you are from Chicago or have any knowledge of Chicago, Winnetka, Illinois, is one of the most affluent suburbs in the state of Illinois, and frankly, probably one of the most affluent suburbs in the United States. The church got it, which meant, in effect, that all PPP is not necessarily indicative of a problem. And in fact, they said, look, we need something to tide us through, and the rules, the rules of the PPP allowed them to do it. Okay, deferrals are kind of the same thing. Deferrals, in theory, if I'm asking you for a deferral, it is, it should be because I'm having cash flow problems. It's because I know that the COVID-19 problems are creating issues. I know that there's issues, but, so I'm asking my bank for a deferral. As we'll talk about today, deferrals don't always mean problems. Depending on how a bank and how your bank or how your credit union handed out deferrals, it may have simply been an opportunistic borrower who saw the way of preserving some cash. Okay. Bottom line to start, if your loan administration is strong, if you've enforced your covenants, if you've done your work, you probably won't have as big a problem as far as if you haven't. So the big questions that we want to help you ask today and this is equally true whether you're doing a merger and acquisition or thinking about it, or if you're simply doing the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling that you have to do to maintain your loan portfolio, is very simply, what is the high-risk part of your portfolio? Where is it and why? And secondly, how close are you staying to your borrowers? as this pandemic expands, as the recession grows, and what are you doing to monitor the condition of your credit portfolio? So, one of the things I'll do is for those of you who, who know me, at one point in my life, I was a journalist. I was a newspaper writer, and I was a magazine editor before I went to grad school and received an MBA. So one of the things in journalism that we believe in is the concept of inverted pyramid, which is to get the most important news up first. So what we decided to do in this today is to get the key takeaways up front, to kind of frame the discussion, number one, and to give you an understanding really clear of what we think the most important issues that you're going to face in the next few months might be in terms of your credit portfolio, in terms of maintaining a good handle on it, in being able to act accordingly as soon as something happens. The first one is something that just the more credit reviews we do, the more crying I tend to do, which is to demand covenant compliance, including financial statements from all your borrowers. And I say more crying than I do because I can't tell you how many times I've gone into credit portfolios and in 2020, not seeing any financial statement updates, any term loan reviews or any annual reviews of the credit portfolio since the loan was originated, say, back in 2017. You look at it, and, you're, and a couple of my guys in the last few weeks have come to me, and the first thing they've said is, how am I supposed to do something with this when the last set of financials we have are from 2017? And the answer is, work with what you got, guys. Figure it out, and we'll talk about how to do that to some degree. But the first one is, 
the demand covenant compliance. Our recommendation very strongly is to go to your lending departments if you're in the finance group, if you're in the lenders lending group, go to your borrowers and ask them, first of all, okay, I gotta have financials, okay? It's been our experience that even with borrowers who won't have a tax return until October, probably should have some interim financial statements that you can review. And I would encourage you, I'd recommend you, plead even, to consider pushing back on them and asking for whatever you can get. You want to know where your borrowers are. To the extent that it's possible, make sure that you're looking at the data. You're gathering it. You're spreading it. You're spreading it properly. Okay, don't wait until November, October, November, when you start getting... Um, when you start getting the numbers and start spreading then. The time, the time to do this is as soon as you can, okay? The other thing that we've seen lately, and it's something that caused my stomach to churn a little bit when I saw it, was that we had, we had loan files that we've seen recently on fairly sizable borrowers of banks where, guess what? The tax returns are in the file, but you know what, folks? Nobody had bothered to spread them. There have been no reports, no, no memorandums, no nothing that asked the question, what exactly do we have here? Well, you can guess what we did when we saw those things. We did spread them. And in a couple of cases, we didn't like what we saw. In fact, we were kind of concerned about what we were seeing. Okay? So spread the financial data, do the covenant checks, do the analyses as soon as you receive it. You see issues, follow up fast. Talk to your borrowers. Try to understand why things are the way that they are. It may be COVID. It may be environmental issues. It may be something else. But make sure that you've got it in a file. There's another thing that's really important to us, and that as a reviewers, we come in and we argue this. Our clients don't always agree with us. I'll be candid. But it's really important. If it's not in a file, you know, the credit file is like a Bible in the sense that it is the governing documents, it is the condition, it's everything you ever wanted to know about the credit. And if it isn't in the credit file, it doesn't exist. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is to the extent that it might be read, that updates, analytics, so forth, memos might be resident in files that your credit officers have. Take a good hard look at those and make sure that all of those things are all of those things are in the credit file, that they're moved. My advice is if you talk to somebody, if you have a contact with them, put it in a credit file. Scan it in, file it, however you do it. But make sure it's there and make sure that you understand what it is you've done and how you're doing it. The last point that we make in terms of knowing your borrowers is frankly visit your borrowers. Now I get that with COVID-19, I get with the pandemic that you may not be able to physically go out and say hello to them, sit down with them, have lunch with them, do whatever it is your institution likes to do to meet with your borrowers. It may be a site inspection, but for some of you, if you can, put the mask on, um, put the mask on, go out, follow your local social distancing um, customs, and do what it is you need to do. Okay, follow up fast, understand what it is you're doing. The second key takeaway real quickly, again, on an inverted pyramid, is kind of focusing on loan policies. Most loan policies that we look at get updated every now and then. But one of the things that year over year that we have seen is to check, is the credit limits pretty much stay the same. Every bank has exposure limits as to how much of a particular type of loan they optimally want in a portfolio. One of the things that we think you need to do is to take a very hard look at all of the exposure limits that currently exist in your portfolio Start to think about the question of whether those exposure limits make sense. Use them.
for this year and maybe for next year to send a message through to your um, to your credit credit administrators and credit officers that maybe we need to turn the spigot off on certain types of loans that are more of a concern to you as you do your credit reviews, do your credit analyses, and so forth. The second thing that we talk about is maybe you ought to tighten up your debt coverage ratios and your loan-to-value requirements just simply to give yourself a little extra protection. One of the key issues here that we see in our reviews that I would encourage everybody to be looking at is are you granting exceptions for any of these factors? If you are, double down on making sure that those exceptions are temporary and what are the provisions if your borrowers don't hit them? I'm not a big fan of exceptions, to be blunt. I know every bank in the world makes them. I know you have to do it from time to time. But now more than ever, I would be really, really careful about granting exceptions to your lending policies right now. And if you do, double, triple, quadruple document. And then if you do have a loan with an exception inside of it, inside your portfolio that you've granted in this environment, the administration of that loan is probably more important than ever. Okay. Next option is get out of certain types of loans. Yeah, no, maybe. This is where your risk officer and your credit officer may not see eye to eye. But it begins to having to ask the question, is it time to back away from certain types of lending? Because quite frankly, it's just not making any sense. One area to really focus on, if you decide that a loan or a lending relationship is impaired, start to look at any lines of credit that are attached to that relationship and ask the question, do we really want to limit the line of credit? If you've got an impaired loan in a relationship, or if you think that the line of credit's impaired, you really ought to be thinking twice about whether that's what you want to be doing or not. So I would look at those very, very closely. Last point here is we've seen a little bit of activity lately in loan sales. And if you've written the loan downs, if you've taken a charge on it, you really may want to be thinking about whether there are parts of your portfolio that if you can sell it, maybe you ought to, okay? And whether it's mortgage loans that you think are probably a little riskier, or whether it's commercial, commercial, mor commercial mortgages, commercial re real estate loans, think about that. And think about whether it is what it is you think you may want to do and what you might not want to do. So with that, we move on to another polling question. Gabe, do you want to read this one? Emily, shall take care of it. Okay, yeah, great. I'll take this. And our second polling question, has your company granted a significant number of loan payment deferrals? And your options are A, very few, less than 5% of your loans by balance. B, as needed, 5 to 20% of your loans by balance. C, considerable, more than 20% of your loans by balance. Or D, this question is not applicable to me. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. Give everyone just a couple more seconds. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Gabe, over to you. All right, a few more uh, doesn't apply than I thought it would be. But before I comment on the results, just as a reminder, I'm monitoring the Q&A. And so if you have questions, please submit them. And then as the moderator, I will incorporate them as best I can into uh, the presentation. So far, we've got uh, questions that kind of fit in our last section on M and A, and we'll we'll work those in. Uh, but again, please uh, submit questions, and we if we aren't able to get to them today, we will respond to them in the end. So, uh, as needed, considerable. It's quite a few considerable. Um, if just based off our client base, I mean the B's and C's probably definitely definitely uh, this is consistent with what we're seeing. Uh, how about you, Dave? 
More B than C, Gabe. Um, we've had a couple here and there that are very few, but I think B is probably the one we see most. And I think the number actually, from what we've seen to date, is probably somewhere in the five to ten percent of the loans by balance. Um, and that really, if you look at the loans as a percentage of the total loans in the portfolio, it's a lot smaller than that. But where you've got it, it's been very notable. And it's creating um, it's creating some issues. So yeah, definitely say the okay. C's, you know, those the C's I would tend to be you know higher consumer portfolios is you know just as a generalization I, I believe. But yeah, I would tend to agree with that. We've seen commercial people a little reluctant initially to take advantage of it, but what has happened over time is that there has been a there really has been a jump start to that. And I think the other thing that relies on it is how distressed the economy around the bank might be. So with that in mind, <clears throat> let's talk about what's, good, what's coming and thinking about what's next. Okay, I start by saying I think every one of us has had a mother or a grandmother or a dad who's looked at you and said, don't go looking for trouble and wagging their finger at them. You just don't want to look for it. All it's going to do is make your life miserable. Well, you know, folks, I think today we're going to be looking for a little more trouble. And I start, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but I think this one is really kind of interesting. And we did this a couple of years ago for the first time for one of our loan review clients on an ongoing basis. And we were trying to figure out where we wanted to focus our energies. Now, we had, a, we had an engagement letter that said you had to do this, you had to do that. But within a portfolio, we were asking the question, okay, how do, you, how do you bifurcate or bisect what you're looking at, if you will, cut the dictionary to find what it is we want to look at? So there's a lot of loans in a portfolio. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first thing we did, so we started with loan growth. And one, this one startled me a little bit. We looked at the loan growth for institutions that still existed between two, at the time we did this, and we did the same thing here, between 2000 and 2008, and then between 2011 and 2019 in this example. And we limited this one to California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, New York, Montana, or New York, Nevada, excuse me. I should, check my glasses, Montana, Alaska, and Hawaii, okay? So we look basically at the area where Moss Adams has the greatest, the greatest percentage of its clients. So we look at the numbers. We compared the loan growth year over year on an aggregate basis. We recognize that some of this is going to be driven by M&A, but a lot of it, frankly, is organic. And when we looked at the comparisons and we correlated the two, it was a mind blower. The fact that 91% correlation coefficient or 0 0.919 correlation coefficient between the last recession and this one caused us to ask the first question, are we doing anything any different than we did between 2000 and 2008 in the run up to the last, last recession? And so if we're asking that, I would encourage everybody on this session to be asking the same question, which is, are you seeing the kind of growth in your portfolio that was similar to what you saw before the last recession? Now, past performance doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to replicate, replicate it, the, the results we got last time this time. But it's an indicator of where you ought to look. And if I'm growing like this, the next question has got to be, where am I growing in my portfolio? So the next thing we did was we looked at it and said, well, here's the good news. The good news is, is that the net charge-offs that this same group of institutions has experienced between 2001 and 2009 compared to now, is a whole lot less now 
than it was then for most of the time period. In short, we got out of the recession faster. And the question now is that as we go into 2020 and 2021, what are we going to see? The issue with 2020 is quite simple. With PPP and with deferrals, we're not going to see for a few months yet what the impact of this is going to be. I think you're more likely to see the impact of this problem to be in 2021 than it is now. But that said, if you're going to look for places, if you're looking for places to look in a portfolio, again, you go back to last time and you start to ask the question, where within the portfolio do we have problems? Well, my cocker spaniel can probably acknowledge that construction and development lending was going to be a problem. But many banks made some changes, many did some differences and so forth. Is that the same as it would be last time? I don't know. I'd be starting to look, if I was you folks, in that portfolio and asking myself, what have I got? One of the things that we've seen, particularly in West Coast banks, has been a propensity to do um, propensity to do construction lending on high on high value um, resident residences in places like the Silicon Valley or in some of the more affluent neighborhoods in west of Los Angeles. And so the question is, are those loans at issue this time? and to start really looking at where we are. The question is also, could it get this bad again? In the West, perhaps not, but you've got to really take a hard look at where the speculative parts of the portfolio are. Same thing, the other two areas that we had last time, some fairly significant problem, were in commercial real estate, particularly investor-owned commercial real estate. And the second piece is commercial lending to look at um, whether that could be a large issue if and under the circumstances, what do you think you've got? The point is, use your experience to go back and start to look at where you are. The other point that I would drive home is that in your day-to-day -day management of the portfolio, look really closely at what your CECL results are compared to the kind of credit review that we want to we want to think about and the question that you, i think is needs to be faced with this is the CISO may came up with one value and i'm guessing that most of the institutions in this meeting probably are using some type of panel of peer group or panels to come up with it come up with loss ratios the question is when you do that does the loan review does an economic loan review, rather than just a compliance review, does the economic review match what's happening with CECL? Something to keep in mind as you move towards CECL. More importantly, though, in today's environment, the question you've really got to ask is, where is the high risk element of your portfolio? And this is suggesting it's probably um, non-owner-occupied CRE your construction lending, and your commercial, particularly commercial lines of credit. Now with that, let's move on and go to the, let's go to the next polling question. All right, our third polling question. How do you grant loan payment deferrals? And your options are A, on request, but limited to no financial review. B, only on the basis of demonstrated financial need, C, after a complete and detailed financial review. D, for the first 60 or 90 days on request. Afterward, only with a detailed financial review. Or E, not applicable. I don't work at a financial institution or company that lends, and I'm only here for the CPE. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. I'll give everyone a couple more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Gabe, over to you. All right. That's good to see folks uh, completing a detailed financial review. I know it was interesting times you know, as things ebbed and flowed and 
certainly early on, people were looking at three month deferrals and then there was this sentiment of, well, I'm just gonna have to extend it another three months, let's go six months. I think that lasted about two weeks of conversations that I was having with folks. And then it was like, that's not very good portfolio risk management. So let's go back to three months and check in on them before we give them another three. And so um, definitely, definitely interesting times. Any thoughts on these, Dave? Yeah, D is what we see most often, Gabe. Um, we saw a lot of situations where for the first 60 or 90 days deferral, the, the banks would send them a form basically legally saying that, hey, um, hey, that we've got an issue that's associated with um, cash flow. You send them the form, they fill it out, they agree to it, they, sign, they basically sign a form, and you get a 60 or 90-day deferral. The second time through, you get a detailed financial analysis, and you really focus on that, and you really fo and you basically say, okay, I want all the data. I want a justification for why you're deferring another 60 or 90 days. Okay. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of, at least initially, a complete and detailed financial review here for this. So it was usually D, um, rarely B, a little bit A, but A will com A really merges into B over time. So anyway, with that in mind, let's move on a little bit to finding problems. And again, keep in mind the first thing is we, of course, we're looking for problems here. And the challenge here is to basically look and ask the question, all right, where have I got issues? And there's a couple of places that we've seen lately that I just want to, that stand out to us. And I just really would kind of like to talk about it for a moment. One is construction loans, okay? You've got construction loans for whatever reason are delayed. If they're over budget, if they're not hitting the numbers they're supposed to, the first thing I'd be doing is asking, all right, what's going on here? The second thing is, what if it's delayed, if it's 100% funded, if the budget is blown, the question is, really, why? And given the uncertainty in the economic environment that we have today, will the sale value on a project be sufficient to cover the debt service, okay? In other words, is the appraisal that you predicated your loan on, does it still hold today? The one area that I really want to stress, and this is something, again, if you haven't guessed, I'm a little bit of a Chicago guy. I've lived in Chicago for most of the last 40 years. And one of the things that we saw in the last recession is what we called late to the party rehabilitation loans. They were construction rehab loans that were being done for properties that had fallen into a significant state of disrepair. And usually had a tradesman, somebody like a carpenter or a plumber, or even sometimes firemen and policemen who had skills and they were doing this as kind of a hobby, got money from the bank. And when times got tough, they couldn't sell the house, the two flat or the three flat for anything close to what they had projected when they made the loan. The appraisal was way high. And so if you've got something that's fairly recent, that's late to the party, I would really be asking the question, what exactly is going on here? What's happening? Second area, lodging, hospitality, and retail slash shopping centers. These are the areas, I think everybody's got some of this somewhere in your portfolio. If it's a lodging and hospitality, a bed and breakfast, you want to make sure that the average daily occupants and the, and the average daily rates, how they've changed. This is where, if you're not getting monthly updates on this stuff, and a lot, of, a lot of banks we work with probably aren't, what happens over time? How often do you get the performance reports and start to look at things like, okay, if it's a motel and hotel, is it flagged or unflagged? If it's a, if it's a retail center, who is the, who is the um, anchor tenant? One of the things that I found interesting just recently, we looked at a loan that was secured by a strip center that the anchor tenant was kinder care. We went back and forth on that one because the problem is you had kinder care and you had about eight other mom and pop type shops. 
the mom and pops, it was in a state that had been very aggressive in um, sheltering in place. So the problem was, okay, those mom and shops, some of the some mom and pop, some of it's going to fall off. But what's the implication for something like a kinder care where, you know, is there going to be the level of the level of daycare that kinder care is able to provide that people are going to need in order to in order to do their work? And with work from home, remote working and so forth, how's that going to work out? We debated that back and forth for a, quite a bit. I think we're still candidly debating some of that. Okay, a couple of things to look at regardless is what's your bank's history of pursuing personal guarantees? To be candid, nobody likes to do it. And in our client base, we have some guys who are proud of it and who work really hard and they say, look, we're going to go after it. And we really are. You gave me a guarantee. You made me a promise. I expect you to keep it. We have other banks that are so concerned about their reputation but they really don't. The other thing that we've been spending an awful, awful lot of time on is how much liquidity really exists within a borrower, and can you get their hands on it? As a side note, one of the things that we have seen lately, we were locking, watching and reviewing what one of our client's targets looked at and said that their hierarchy of payment was. Obviously, the first hire, the, first, the primary source of repayment was going to be cash flow from the property that secured the loan. They made the secondary source of payment the, the liquidity and the financial strength of the borrower, even before the, even before the liquidation of the collateral and, and execution of any guarantee requirements. We thought that was kind of interesting. The reason we did was it presumed that your borrower was going to do all that he can to make this property work. So the question is, if you get in a pinch, is the borrower just going to shed and wait for you to come after him personally, or is he going to pull the cash flow from other parts of his business or other parts of his or her wealth to try to come up with an answer? We've seen some issues lately with multifamily. The issue there has been over construction. That's uniquely a market situation. I'd look very carefully at that, and I'd also look to see to make sure that if you've got a construction project on multifamily, that if there's tax credits involved or tax support involved, you're getting to where you need to get to with it. Okay. With that, you know, who are your borrowers? You know, obviously with commercial lending, we want to make sure the bar. We know who the borrowers are. We know what their strength is. We know that if the lines of credit are out there, if there's a concern, um, two things. Number one, that you're not afraid to choke the line of credit off. And secondly, are the UCCs and security liens all set up? Okay. Um, one other thing that we see a lot of issues with is we call it resting, but cleanup is the other word for it on lines of credit. And the question is. Do they get cleaned up or rested for 30 to 90 days a year, depending on the policy? May, be careful, obviously, about granting, about granting exceptions to this policy. And if they're not cleaned up, I would be very, very, very focused on this. Okay. A couple of things that we do, as I mentioned in the outset, we've got a lot of our clients that don't have updated financial data. We stress the portfolios. We take whatever data we have and work with it. We try to say, okay, if the last data they got is 2017 and there's not a tax form, there's not a financial statement for 2018 or 2019, let's work with it. You go into the appraisal, pull the NOI. You go into the financial statements, you pull out what you can for NOI. You start stressing the NOI. Why? Because we're focused on cash flow. We're focused, the value of the property is its ability to cash flow to owners. So we start looking at cash flow and we shock it. And the shock will depend on what we think the environment merits, okay? The most recent one we did was 10 to 50%. All right, we shock it. Then we take the cap rate and we apply the cap rate to look at what the appraisal value is. It does two things. 
Number one is that it tells us realistically where the stress point on that loan is going to be given the most recent data that we can find in the portfolio. That's number one. Number two, it tells us what the implication of value on the portfolio or on the loan is going to be as the loan, as the economics around the, the underlying collateral change. Okay. For relationships, we also want to look at the total relationship the borrower has both within the bank and without the bank. The goal here is really simple, to make sure that we're not going to be surprised if something does happen and what and how big the total exposure, which means we spend a lot of time focusing on global debt service coverage as well. Okay. One of our favorites is the whole question of when is old reliable not so old, not so reliable. Old reliable is kind of defined as a loan that's been there, that performs, that's done what it's done. And this problem that we're having here kind of grew out of some experience we had in California over the years. We're doing some work in the Bay Area. And we kind of noticed, hey, something weird is happening here. We got about a 50% loan to value ratio on one hand. And we got a 130 or 135 debt service or debt coverage ratio on the other. If I've got that kind of if that kind that kind of loan to value ratio, my gut says my debt service ratio should be a lot higher than it is. So that's why we take a hard look at the valuation assumptions that went into that appraisal and how they got there. Okay, and in a particular another circumstance where this really rang true was we started looking at the cap rate that was used in the income method of valuation. Okay, the cap rate normally should be something approximating, at least in our view, a weighted average cost of capital, okay? So six and a half to seven and a half in today's environment really makes sense. We were looking at circumstances where the cap rate was in the one to two and a half percent range. And we started getting really serious indigestion over it. So we did this kind of something similar to what's in this graph. We took a million dollars, a million dollars of net operating income and ran it across different bands given a um, given declines in net operating income and also given changes in my cap rate. And we think normally of going up and down on this graph, if you know, just vertically to line up the line up the dots. In effect, if my if my net operating income on a two percent to be on a far left hand corner falls from a million eight hundred thousand, my value falls from fifty million to forty million. Okay, it's that simple. What we found in that circumstance was that the cap rate was driving appraisal values that were dramatically higher than they should have been. Okay. And when we moved it down to more of a normalized cap rate in this chart between, say, 650 and an 8, we were getting dramatically different values for the property, for the commercial properties we were talking about. And the consequence was the loan-to-value ratio went from about 55% or 60% to well over 100%. In short, folks, it was an aha moment for that, for that bank. And so what we're trying to stress here is, you have, first of all, you've got to reconcile the income and market method and ask the question, what's going on if there's a dramatic difference between the two? And that should be caught in your appraisal review. And the second thing that you should be looking at is the cap rate. And if, in fact, that does change over time because of lending policies, procedures, practices, debt equity ratios change, um, you know, that's something to keep a very, very close eye on. Second thing that we did, and this one was a good surprise, and this was a little something that we just saw fairly recently. We're looking at a loan where in March, the borrower owned a retail property and he had a loan out on it. It was about a 10, um, he, sought, he sought an extension or a deferral more correctly, okay? 
His total credit concentration was two million. He had a line of credit for or six million, a line of credit for two million NAR. The bank went in on this three and a half million dollar loan and said, Okay, yeah, we'll give you a three month extension. It was secured the loan was secured by a ten thousand square foot um standalone retail property. It was leased to somebody that if I told you who it was, you'd sit there and say, wow, that's the gold standard of tenants. Okay, the client was gravely concerned at first, but we started looking at the statistics. For 2018, before COVID-19, he had a debt coverage ratio of 343, loan to value was 55, and we ran a stress on this and basically said they'd have to have a reduction in that operating income of 65% just to get to the point, the 120 break even point with their policy. And so we said, you know, folks, this really, really, this is, we'll keep this great at an average loan because it's an average loan and a deferral is nothing more than a guy taking advantage of the circumstances. So with that, we have another, yet another polling question that kind of foretells where we're going for the next couple of minutes. All right, our final polling question. Do you think an acquisition, buy or sell, is in your near-term future? And your options are A, of course, we're always looking for the right partner. B, not near-term, but once we are through the pandemic. C, only when the SEIC or NCUA offers assistance. D, when you know what freezes over. Are you kidding? We have enough issues to deal with as is. Or E, I'm here for the CPE. Once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll give everyone a couple more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Abe, over to you. All right. You know, I'd say B is consistent with you know, what we hear when we talk to our clients, that there's going to be opportunity out there uh, coming out of this. And uh, Dave, before we transition into the acquisition part, I do want to kind of meld a few questions together and see if we can weave these into the mm -hmm. next discussion. But we're getting a question on how you reconcile the increasing concerns surrounding declining credit quality, which we're all concerned with what's going on. So people are provisioning like crazy. Uh, so allowance levels are rising uh, as we all see in industry yet there's continued low levels of credit marks in an M&A context and you'd think from a CECL standpoint or even an inherent loss standpoint people are looking out with the unallocated that the, the credit marks would be you know a little more consistent with what we're seeing but there seems to be a little bit of divergence so maybe we can work that into the next uh, next part of our discussion here of course and by the way that is an excellent question it is one that's troubled us i'm not going to kid you gabe as we get through this but and you'll see it in one of the slides we're going to show in just a moment what's what we what's happened and then we'll talk about what we expect i would say real quickly on a polling question i think b is what we're seeing um a is a little bit of a is a little bit of the, is a little bit of opportunistic and that's what's kept us kept us busy the last few months. And um, I think D, there's a lot more of D than anybody's acknowledged. And if we had 9.4% here, I think is, is really great. But the question, there's a couple of things I want to talk about real briefly as we go into M&A real fast. And the first thing is, Gabe, and this is something you can talk, kind of comment on as well, but the question of what your CECL numbers are going to say versus what your um, what your ASC 805 numbers are going to say. Directionally, they should be similar, but don't be surprised if they're not the same because they're calculated very differently. And 805 requires one thing, CECL requires another. Now, we've, we've done, since the advent of CECL, I want to say somewhere between 12 and 15 M&A transactions. They generally are close, but there is going to be a calculation difference based on how we perceive a market participant life of loan credit discount. 
Gabe, have you seen that kind of thing, or have you had discussions with your clients about that? Well, I generally like to think they're they're much more aligned, you know, in the accounting standard wise. But I can see it being a little different from a methodology standpoint. I mean, I don't know that the methodology in terms of valuation side has changed that much, but you know, the different you know your forecast period and all those different things when uh, in determining allowance i could you know i i can appreciate that the calculation could be you know slightly different okay so the the thing to keep in mind as we go forward we talked a lot about credit review today and about the things that we encourage you to be doing now if your institution is thinking about or even considering m and a over the next over the next year or two, I really would be encouraging you to focus on exactly the same issues we talked about today. Do it for your own portfolio as well as for anybody else. For your own portfolio, the importance of getting an economic measure and going beyond compliance issues and looking not just at whether everything complies with your policy and safe sound banking practice, but also focusing on where your problems are and how do you resolve it is going to be a critically important factor over the next year or 18 months or so. Okay, in looking at acquisitions, the question Gabe talked about was how credit, credit discounts are set and why there's a divergence with it. A couple of quick issues that I'll raise. Number one is when we do it, we, we kind of triangulate into an answer. And there's three approaches that we use. Number one is to look at a market basket or a guideline group or a peer group of companies that are similar in nature to the bank that's the target. We look at that. Same thing for credit union. We'll look at a guideline group of similar credit unions. We'll look at those, we'll focus on them, and we'll look at what the loss history is. By the way, in that same group, We'll also look at the individual institution's loss history and see whether it's robust enough to be able to apply it and how it compares to a market participant basket. If it is, we'll use the institution's own. The second thing we look at is, of course, their CECL calculation. And even though they're calculated a little different, we want to make sure, A, we're directionally headed in the same, headed, we're directionally aligned, but more importantly, the CECL gives me one indication of where they think it should be. And if you've got a huge diversion, it's going to be a problem explaining that to your regulators, to your accountants, and ultimately if you have shareholders or owners to who your shareholders and owners are. You're going to have to explain that. You're going to have to understand. The third thing we do is we'll look at loan reviews. And we'll look at what they did and how they did it. And one of the things that's really important for us is to make sure that you've documented your conclusions that come out of your loan review. How'd you come up with them? How'd you decide what loans were impaired um, or had credit deterioration in them, depending on whether you're on 326 or not? How'd you make that decision? What factors did you consider? When you looked at a loan, what did you do? What procedures did you take to make sure that you got comfortable with the credit? That is more important than ever to get those things documented before you announce a transaction, and then again before you close it, okay? Whether you use outside help or whether you do it internally, the issue is the same. How strong is the documentation on the portfolio? Okay, as we move to the next slide, what you can see is this is what we have seen in our market with our clients as far as average loan discounts, okay? First of all, as we talk about, they have to be life of loan, market participant factors. And since 2015, with one exception, which was a weird situation caused by New York City taxing medallions, um, these trends have been shrinking down as the question are raised a little earlier. We've gone from 352 back in 2015 as the average credit discount to down to 123. The question was, and I think it's a fair one, is how do you reconcile all these concerns that I'm talking about with, um, with low levels of credit marks in an M&A? And I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not comfortable with it, and we will do, we have been doing as of late, some adjustments in how we do this. But secondly, the only way you can reconcile it 
is to document the credit review and be able to have enough information in a credit summary and credit analysis that was done on the target bank to get comfortable with where they're at. And that means stressing what it is you've got for NOI, for values, and for economics that are in that portfolio. Look for the break point and then ask the question, does it make sense? Okay. What we're seeing so far this year, and again, keep in mind that a couple of these, that a, that a bunch of these deals closed in the first quarter of the year before COVID was really, really rampant, was we saw about a 123 um, credit discount, and we saw a 21 basis point interest rate. I mean, that's on average. We're getting there. Okay. So, Credit, and then one other thing that I want to talk about really, really briefly is core deposit intangibles. We, you can see that the average has kind of fallen over the years from 174, 178 down to 146, and so far this year we're at 62. For the last half of this year, to the extent we have any transactions at all, that is going to fall way, way, way through the floor. We have we just finished reviewing one for a client last week where we saw no core deposit value. We had to work it. We had to increase the use of market participant variables in it to even come up with a value at all. So do not be surprised if you see CDI um, if you see CDIs that are down to almost nothing. So. With that, Gabe, um, I'll turn it back to you if we have any questions from the audience or All right, we are out of time, raised. but uh, we're out of time, but um, please reach out to us if you have any additional questions, Dave, and I would be happy to work with you. And I'll turn it over to Emily to wrap the presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Gabe. And thank you, Dave, for a great presentation today. Uh, if you do have any more questions for our presenters, you may still submit them in the Q&A window or you can reach out to them directly. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.